Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We will be exploring policy directions for a report that GFI commissioned consulting firm CE Delft to conduct. This report is a life cycle analysis and techno-economic assessment of cultivated meat. Thank you, Lauren. This will be a rough agenda for today's panel. After I introduce the panelists, we'll be hearing a presentation from El Elliot on the report findings, followed by a panel discussion with both of our panelists and an audience Q&A session. Before I begin, I wanted to share these participation guidelines. We remind all attendees to be present and engaged and practice active listening, speak courteously to others and respect the idea of others, and participate in the chat. While not all comments will be responded to, all will be recorded and acknowledged. Please note any comment, verbal or written, that is meant to attack or intimidate another person or is obscene will not be tolerated. If you do experience any te technical difficulties, however, please feel free to exit the session and navigate to the Expo tab and visit our help desk. As for who will be on the panel, my name is Saloni Shah, and I'm a food and agriculture analyst at the Breakthrough Institute, which is an environmental think tank based in Berkeley, California. My research primarily focuses on technology and policy and how that can improve the sustainability of the food system. And I'll be moderating today's panel. We are joined by our lovely panelists, Elliot Swartz and Emily Hennessy. Emily Hennessy is a policy associate at the Good Food Institute. Prior to joining GFI, she worked on sustainable food efforts at Georgia Organics as the Farm to School Director and Director of Programs. Previously, she was Sustainable Programs Coordinator at Emory University's Office of Sustainable Initiatives. She also holds a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology from Emory and a master's in public health with a concentration in food systems from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she's also a Farm Foundation Young Agri-Food Leader. Elliot is lead scientist at GFI and he specializes in cultivated meat. His work at GFI analyzes the technical and economic bottlenecks facing the industry, he identifies opportunities to accelerate industry, and he educates scientists, the public, and other industry stakeholders. He previously also completed his PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles. We have two very impressive panelists, and now I'll have Elliot take it away and share his presentation on the report. Thanks, Saloni, and uh, welcome everyone to today's session. As, as mentioned, my name is Elliot Swartz, and as a primer for this session, I'll be reviewing some of the key findings from a recent pair of studies that examined the costs and environmental impacts of cultivated meat production. So these two studies, as mentioned, were conducted by the Dutch research firm CE Delft, uh, but they were commissioned by GFI and Gaia, which is a nonprofit based in Belgium. So these studies specifically aim to model a commercial scale cultivated meat production facility that could output 10,000 tons of a minced cultivated meat product annually, and that operated hypothetically in, in the year 2030. For the life cycle assessment, the environmental impacts of one kilo of cultivated meat were compared to one kilogram of conventionally produced beef, pork, or chicken. And for cultivated meat, the studies modeled scenarios based on a global average energy mix or an entirely sustainable energy mix. The model also assumed that for conventional meat, this would be produced with sustainable energy sources and also as assumes additional ambitious improvements in carbon emissions reductions through the use of things like feed additives to reduce methane emissions and no land use change associated with soy and feeds. Importantly, over 15 different companies 
along the supply chain were involved as data or knowledge providers for these studies. Next slide, please. So this summary figure from the life cycle assessment shows that cultivated meat could have a lower carbon footprint and fewer overall climate impacts than really any form of conventional meat, especially when the energy mix to produce it is predominantly sourced from sustainable sources. So ongoing efforts to decarbonize the energy sector could synergize with future meat production using cultivated meat technology. So you'll notice on this slide that cultivated meat produced using conventional energy, which is the third bar from the left, scores significantly lower in environmental impacts than any form of conventional beef production, but scores slightly higher than these ambitious scenarios set forth for uh, conventional chicken and pork production. The gray bars denote the global average carbon footprint of conventional meat production, which really varies depending on where you are in the world and what, what practices are being undertaken. And you can see that the cultivated meat using conventional energy sources scores about uh, the same as the global average of conventional chicken production. However, if these future facilities were to run on sustainable energy sources, that can reduce the carbon footprint by up to 80% for cultivated meat production and really undercut the uh, carbon footprint of conventional animal meat production. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes um, some of the other key impact categories that were analyzed in the LCA. So in particular, cultivated meat is anticipated to use significantly less land than conventional meat production because it really requires fewer feed crops to be grown as inputs. And this is really true regardless of the energy sources that are used to produce it. So if cultivated meat and other alternative proteins like plant-based meats made up a significant portion of future dietary protein sources, land could theoretically be used more productively to sequester carbon, uh, restore habitats, and mitigate biodiversity loss that's ongoing. Additionally, cultivated meat was shown that to potentially be able to decrease air pollution, particularly air pollution caused by ammonia particulates formed during conventional meat production, reduce other associated greenhouse gas emissions like from nitrous oxide, as well as save on water use compared to conventional beef production. In this particular study, water use was actually found to be slightly higher than conventional chicken and pork production, and that was mainly due to water use for solar panel production upstream in the supply chain, where under the renewable energy scenarios in this study, it assumed that about 50% of the energy would come from solar sources. Next slide. Another complementary study looking at the techno-economics of production used the same production model that, using the same production model, showed that cultivated meat could compete on costs with some forms of conventional meat production by the end of the decade in this model facility. So it's important to note here that these costs are calculated for 100% cultivated meat products, but many of the products that we anticipate reaching the marketplace throughout this decade may actually use cultivated meat as an ingredient in an otherwise hybrid product with plant-based ingredients. And that could help to defray the overall cost contribution and make these products accessible to a broader set of consumers on faster timescales. So at a high level, this study found that the growth medium is currently a major cost for production, but we and others believe that these costs can be dramatically reduced in a relatively short time frame. And actually tomorrow I'll be moderating a session focused on advances in cell culture media uh, for those that are curious about some of the ongoing research in this area. Now some of the longer term bottlenecks identified in the TEA include the cost as well as the amount of new greenfield infrastructure that would be required to scale up the industry, as well as really increasing the global research and development of this field that will help to improve and maximize the production process efficiencies that are really going to be needed in order for these costs to come down to more competitive levels. So these two reports are freely available online and they are can be found as linked resources on the bottom of this session page. Um, I'll just note that it's important to remember that these studies are perspective in nature and some of the assumptions taken in there may change as the industry matures. 
But really what we want to be able to do with these findings is use them as guidance to address and eliminate some of the bottlenecks that were identified to inform future facilities planning efforts to make sure that environmental impacts are as low as possible, as well as educate policymakers around some of the best strategies to support industry growth, which we'll be talking about. So uh, next slide, please. At a high level, the main conclusions from the study are really that, you know, how we source the growth medium and how efficiently it's used really greatly affects the future costs and environmental impacts of production. So, you know, sourcing inputs from something like microalgae versus soy are going to have different environmental impacts, as will sourcing recombinant proteins from facilities that run on sustainable ener energy versus those that do not. All of these sorts of considerations really matter for the future supply chain as well as its environmental and cost impacts. Additionally, to, to realize the greatest environmental gains, cultivated meat manufacturers should operate their facilities with sustainable energy sources or build their own renewable energy infrastructure on their facility uh, grounds. So not only would this help uh, with their bottom line in terms of electricity costs, but it really is the number one thing that companies can do to lower their carbon footprint in this sector. And then lastly, process efficiencies will have to be maximized and favorable financing mechanisms must be available in order for cultivated meat to compete on production costs with more commodity level meat products. In the interim time, I think as this industry scales, Hybrid products really offer a more immediate route to achieving this cost competitive competitiveness at, at faster timescales. Thank you, Elliot, for your insightful presentation. LCAs and TA studies are critical for kickstarting conversations around how to scale the industry both sustainably and economically. This report, as you highlighted, points to key considerations for the industry and policymakers on how to maximize the environmental benefits while also reducing costs of production. It seems that optimizing biological processes involved and using sustainable energy sources to power production are very key to achieve this. The report also points to another critical area of focus, I think, for future LCAs that I'd like to highlight that would potentially significantly improve the carbon footprint of cultivated meat production and further increase support amongst policymakers seeking to mitigate food emissions. The report points out that there needs to be more study of the carbon opportunity costs of cultivated meat. This concept refers to the potential for carbon sequestration via land ecosystem restoration when cultivated meat production replaces some amount of conventional livestock production. Unlike conventional meat production, which is a key driver of deforestation and biodiversity loss, cultivated meat, cultivated meat uses or reduces land use by 62 to 95 percent, as, as the report highlights, compared to um, meat, depending on the kind of meat that it is replacing. To put that into perspective, cultivated meat uses as much land as tofu, so that's not a lot, right? So shifting some amount of conventional meat production to cultivated meat would essentially potentially free a lot of land from being used for animal agriculture. This freed land, depending on the original ecosystem that was there, over time could be restored and rewilded, which would generate potentially a significant amount of additional carbon savings. Or that land can be repurposed for other uses. It could used to grow crops that could feed people instead of animals. It can be used for clean energy production. You can install some solar um, panels or wind turbines, for example, or it could even be used for redevelopment and housing, depending on where it is. This potential for carbon savings is not well understood, and it's something that merits further research and something is something that I hope to study further as well. Um, recently, however, a study by Hayek et al., he's a professor at NYU, they found that shifting to plant-based diets by 2050 could sequester an equivalent of 99 to 163% of the carbon budget available in a scenario where you're limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, so that's potentially a lot. Unfortunately, despite all these benefits that Elliot highlighted um, of cultivated meat production, global governments have only provided $5.5 million, $6 million in funding towards open access research for cultivated meat. But there are several other ways 
that governments could help to accelerate the sector and other alternative proteins. So we'll be hearing about these policy interventions and strategies as we now transition into the panel discussion with Elliot and Emily. As a reminder to attendees, feel free to post questions in the chat that you'd like to be answered in the Q&A. Um, I think that I'd first like to call on Emily and bring her into this the discussion. Um, Elliot touched on some of the policies that could help. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, what aspects of the LCA and TA results do you think would be most compelling for policymakers to engage with? Yeah, so first off, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for that presentation, Elliot, and thanks for um, moderating this, Lonnie. It's great to have you here. I think a major one as policymakers on, on both sides of the aisle are, are really starting to um, understand uh, the reality of climate change um, is that cultivated meat has a, a major opportunity to, to help be a solution to fight the climate crisis. Um, you know, I think in the climate community more broadly, there's this call to electrify everything. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about electric vehicles and, and switching away from natural gas to um, electricity to, um, to to cook our food and power our homes. And that alternative proteins, including cultivated meat, are really the the food and agriculture sector's opportunity to electrify everything. As Elliot said, there's some um, pretty Im impressive um, gains when cultivated meat facilities are, are powered with sustainable energy in particular. Um, another thing that I'll mention that, that Elliot didn't touch on is around the job creation opportunities. So um, regardless of your political affiliation, policymakers obviously love to talk about job creation and economic growth. And the, the TEA from this study found that um, the model um, facility was projected to produce about 130 to 200 um, high paying jobs. Um, there have been some other reports that have come out recently that have also um, projected job growth. So I'll, I'll share a link to a recent McKenzie report in the chat that um, said that for every 500,000 metric tons of cultivated protein that about uh, 5,000 to 5,500 factory jobs would be created. Um, and then obviously there's job creation opportunities um, on other sides of that supply chain too, whether that's from an R&D perspective, a marketing perspective, developing the um, equipment and the inputs that are used for cultivated meat production. Um, so I think that the, the, the job piece is really key, um, whether we're talking about cultivated meat or other alternative proteins um, to, to win over some policymakers around alternative proteins. Definitely, and I wanna zero in on that estimate from McKinsey. Um, to put that number in perspective for our audience, if let's say cultivated proteins made up 1% of the global protein market, which is around about how much plant-based proteins make up, um, you could imagine just multiplying that factory job number by a factor of 10 to about 50,000 to 55,000 jobs globally. Put that in perspective, I think US agriculture employs around 960,000 people in the United States. So that I think gives you a scale of the potential opportunity here and the potential growth here. And thank you for sharing that. Um, report in the chat as well. So great potential for direct and indirect job creation from this um, very innovative industry. Um, Elliot, I wanted to ask you, I know that you've included a summary of recommended stakeholder actions in the LCA and TA. I was wondering if you could maybe highlight a few of those for today's conference attendees. Sure, yeah, so I think what, what follows from this, uh, which, which you highlighted in the introduction, is that one of the most sort of important recommendations that we put forward is, is to really increase investments into global R&D, specifically with an emphasis on, on open access research. I think it's important for the audience to sort of understand how underfunded alternative proteins are compared to comparatively impactful sectors in the climate. So for instance, recent studies have shown that if you look at the production of animal foods, you know, the entire, accounting for the entire value chain, that this could account for closer to 18 to 20% of 
total global greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that really current emissions from animal agriculture are probably at least as high and likely higher than direct emissions from the entire transportation sector. But if we look at, for instance, private sector investments into technologies that aim to reduce the impact of these two sectors, investments across the entire alternative protein industry amount to about $6 billion, which is only about 12% of similar investments into electric vehicles and other charging technologies that are obviously being developed to reduce transportation's emissions uh, from that sector. I think more glaringly is that since 2005, according to our own internal calculations, um, just about $112 million of grants have been awarded for open access alternative protein research. So there's a very large discrepancy in you know, how we're funding and addressing these equally large climate change problems uh, in using transportation and, and food as, as an example. Another recommendation that follows is to incentivize new manufacturing infrastructure. So the TEI actually shows that future facilities are likely to cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And recent projections in this McKinsey report actually suggest that to capture just you know 0.5% of the global meat market using these cultivated methods, that could require approximately 11 to 22 times the uh, total volumetric capacity of the global pharmaceutical industry. So we need a whole lot of new infrastructure uh, in order to have an impact. And it comes as no surprise really that, you know, some of the funds that are being raised by companies in this sector are using that directly to fund the installation of new infrastructure. I think, you know, if we look at alternative protein technologies more broadly, we're not only going to need infrastructure for, you know, the production of the meat products themselves, but also for the processing of raw materials, for equipment building, for uh, extruding equipment, fermentation tanks, bioreactors, et cetera. So local and national governments can provide tax-based benefits uh, and incentives for manufacturers, similarly to what we've seen in electric vehicles and, and battery production industries that can create new manufacturing jobs in the process. And they can also provide debt financing for new facilities and leverage really the growing markets for things like green bonds and other forms of sustainable debt issuance um, to build out these, uh, these facilities. And lastly, I'll just, I'll just touch on, you know, we need to also develop sensible and, and harmonized global regulatory frameworks. Um, as many know, Singapore is really currently the only country on earth to have approved a cultivated meat product. And as other countries are working to finalize their frameworks and eventually release guidances, it's possible that they could differ significantly from country to country. And if that's true, it could hamper industry growth, especially as these companies want to enter new global markets. And so the development of things like shared standards, shared best practices, and then recognition of these from global regulatory authorities will really be critical for the industry's success. And we'll actually have a session on this on Friday um, called Cultivated Meats Path to Market that will, I think, elucidate some of those issues uh, a little bit more clearly. It seems that the scale of innovation, the scale of manufacturing needed in order to help industry um, become successful is being severely underestimated here. Um, I was wondering if we can back up a little bit. You mentioned that funding open access research is really important for the industry to kind of grow and develop. I was just wondering, you know, what is open access research and um, why are governments best suited to fund this kind of research? It seems like there's a lot of VC investment kind of flowing into the industry. What are we missing here? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I think um, you know open access research. I think we sort of define that as research that takes place and the results are presented in in the public domain. Um, open access research is really critical, especially for when technologies are sort of pre competitive or at an early stage of of a readiness level. So essentially, it's very important for governments to really play that role of building this foundational research that's open and out there that you know serves as a knowledge foundation that others can then build on i think there's a lot of examples from you know things that we use all the time today like our cell phone um where the the sort of principal components of phone technology were funded 
by governments, you know, in, in 30 years preceding the invention of a, of a smartphone device, for instance. So in a similar way, um, a lot of, you know, the current state of cultivated meat research is definitely quite early and aspects of other alternative protein technologies are also early. And so we need more uh, open access research to really, again, build that foundation of knowledge that then can be translated effectively into the, into the industry. Right, and on manufacturing, you mentioned a really interesting point about how much capacity is needed in comparison to the pharmaceutical industry. And it seems that um, entirely new production processes are, are being created, right? We're using biomedical kind of technologies and science to you know, create um, novel foods. And I'm just wondering, do you happen to have an understanding of the pace of scaling or the pace of building facilities for cultivated meat in order to capture a greater amount of the um, global protein market or just about how many facilities might need to be constructed to capture a certain portion of the global meat market? Well, it's hard to say for sure. Um, it's, a, it's a loaded question because there's a lot of assumptions that would go into those sorts of calculations. Um, projections like, the, in, like those in the McKinsey report, I think serve as good uh, starters for understanding really the scope of the infrastructure that's needed. Where the industry is at today, um, many of the leading companies are just sort of opening and, and beginning to operate their pilot scale facilities. Um, what comes next is, you know, a, a, another level of scale up and then further more com commercial or industrial scales that follow from that. Um, but there are challenges to be solved in between now and then. Um, and I think a lot of different uh, approaches could be used. I think I was just listening to uh, a panel earlier today that had um, Christy Lagali from Rebellious Foods who are making plant-based chicken, but their whole sort of, uh, you know, approach is to leverage new manufacturing techniques, techniques for plant-based meat that essentially lower the cost of goods of production, which is what we're talking about here with cultivated meat. So uh, we know the costs are high and we know some ways to lower those costs, but that doesn't mean that all of the options have necessarily been explored. So I think um, we definitely welcome, you know, again, this sort of uh, open access research into exploring these sorts of ideas that could then benefit, um, you know, how efficient these future facilities operate. Yeah, definitely. I think as you scale up, you'll begin to identify these issues and bottlenecks and then we can continue to learn from them. In addition to the um, policy inter interventions that um, Elliot mentioned, I'm curious, Emily, do you have any other recommendations that you would add to the list? There are a few that I'd love to, to add to the list. Um, one is to incorporate cultivated meat and alternative proteins more broadly into both national and global climate change policy conversations. Um, you know, we know that it's impossible to meet the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree um, target without addressing the climate impact of our protein production. But the, these conversations are still missing from a lot of the, um, from many of the major climate conversations. Um, you know, in, in the US, for instance, a lot of the conversation around the role of food and agriculture and climate um, over the last year or so has really been focused on the potential of carbon sequestration in soil. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't explore that, but I think that we should think really holistically and make sure that we are in including alternative proteins in these conversations. Um, I also think it's important to note that as governments set net zero targets for themselves, um, that producing uh, cultivated meat and alternative proteins domestically is actually an opportunity for them to reduce their own reduce their own emissions and for them to um, meet their own climate goals more quickly. So I would love to see more synergy and linkages there. Um, also, to your point earlier about the potential for land use. Um, I think that including alternative proteins and cultivated meat into policy conversations and frameworks about how um, the, about land use is really crucial. Um, so, you know, we know that conventional animal ag is the, the number one cause of global deforestation 
and biodiversity loss. Um, and, and you outlined some of the great opportunities for, for what could be done with that land spared. Um, but we need policy incentives as well as frameworks to make that possible. Um, we can't just guarantee that the um, the land that is spared is going to be used in the, the best possible way from a climate um, and biodiversity perspective. So I think there's some opportunities there. Um, and then the last I'll mention is around uh, farmer farmer transitions and kind of the changes in the workforce that, that we will um, likely see in the coming decades. And there are numerous examples and a lot of precedent for the governments both from the local and state level uh, to national governments around the world, um, supporting government funded workforce development and job training programs. And I think as the alternative protein industry grows that there's going to be many opportunities here um, to for, for governments to help ensure that uh, there is a, a socially just transition um, as we see the growth of alternative proteins, but also that the we have enough skilled workers to, to fill all of the, the job opportunities that are going to rise from alternative proteins. Right, an entirely new industry is being created, and I think we're still just beginning to understand the scope of the opportunities presented by the industry, and it'll be interesting to see and figure out how policy can help um, fill those jobs here domestically. I was um, also wondering as a follow-up, what do you think would be the most effective route to achieving some of the policy recommendations that you two have um, kind of laid out? Who are the key stakeholders in, in making these um, recommendations actually a reality as well? So I, I think a lot of work around policy is really around messaging and, and how you frame your message in a way that resonates with the policymaker, the individual policymaker that you're talking with and the constituents that that person represents. And one of the great things about alternative proteins is that there are a lot of different messages that you can use based on what, what's gonna resonate with that person. So, you know, I mentioned jobs, I think that's, that's key. Um, but then beyond that, looking at um, benefits in terms of pandemic prevention and climate change and also um, wanting to, to make sure that, that our country, wherever you're from, is a, a leader in innovation. I think that can really build some positive peer pressure between um, you know, whether that's states at the state level or, or in between different countries, um, that, they're, that all of these things are gonna be different motivators for different policymakers. So you know, making sure that you've uh, that we've we've done our research and and we know what the policy priorities are for uh, different lawmakers is is really crucial for crafting those messages. Um, and um, in terms of stakeholders, similarly, I think it's we, we need a wide array of champions. Um, hopefully, most of you saw um, uh, Rosa Deloro, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, this morning. Uh, during the plenary remarks, um, give her her talk. And um, she's clearly a, a major alternative protein champion here in the US. Um, and we need more congressional champions, but we also need champions um, and with the private sector. We know the private sector has influence in, in politics. Um, and uh, we also need advocacy groups and, and nonprofits and civil society um, to, to put pressure on policymakers to, to support this work. So I think um, really thinking about uh, a broad coalition of stakeholders that can um, work in conjunction with one another is going to be crucial for addressing a lot of these policy opportunities. Definitely. It seems like you both need to cater your messaging depending on what policymaker you're speaking to and what their main sorts of motivations and concerns are, while also building a very wide net when it comes to um, involving groups from you know different sides, different parts of the spectrum, from different areas uh, within the industry and outside of the industry to help put pressure on policymakers. Um, and yeah, very exciting uh, with, with Congresswoman DeLauro as well. I was wondering, kind of reflecting on past industries and how the government has supported um, maybe the acceleration of other sort of sustainable 
um, sustainable industries. Elliot, I was wondering, are there any other industries that you can point to that have effectively leveraged policy mechanisms that have accelerated their growth and development? It seems like in order to address the climate crisis, wholly new technologies and industries will be, will be needed. Sure. Yeah, I think um, there are probably lots of options that one can one choose as, as examples here. Um, but I think broadly, some of the insights from policies that help to propel the renewable energy or electric vehicle sectors and you know, sort of applying or mirroring those onto alternative proteins could be uh, pretty useful. Um, as an example, in, in the United States, one of those policies was the American Recovery and, and Reinvestment Act. And that provided $90 billion in clean energy investments and other tax incentives um, to essentially catalyze the clean energy sector here in the United States back in 2009. And one of the things that that act did was provide funding for ARPA-E, which is an agency that awarded grants for projects at national labs, at academic institutes, nonprofits, you know, small and large businesses, et cetera, to work on this sort of innovative solutions that along with a lot of other global efforts have dramatically decreased the costs for technologies like solar, wind, and batteries at really like astounding rates over the past 10 and 15 years. So additionally, that, that act um, provided loan guarantees that were used to fund some of the larger solar and wind projects here in the US and created a lot of jobs along the way. And in addition, attracted a lot of private investment in the tunes of billions of dollars. So similar sorts of catalytic funding that's a sort of forward looking for alternative proteins um, would really be useful uh, from, from governments. Um, another policy related uh, initiative that governments could take would be to create additional uh, advanced manufacturing institutes that are focused on alternative proteins or incorporate alternative proteins into these sorts of existing institutes. Um, generally, these sorts of things are focused on building more public-private partnerships to advance particular fields of applied sciences. And so these can be modeled after those institutes that are here already in the United States. Um, the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany serve as a good example, as well as some of the work that's currently ongoing within ASTAR in Singapore. So I think sort of zooming out, it's um, important, you know, to understand that some of the, like the more harder policy decisions that we make today lead to much easier ones in the future when it comes to those that govern technologies. So, you know, it's taken 20 years or so for the electric vehicle market to move from what was essentially 0% to nearly 5% of the global annual market share. And we're sort of finally reaching that inflection point where, you know, you have this S curve of, curve of adoption that make new policies that we're seeing today for the phase out of fossil fuel vehicles in certain cities or countries by the end of the decade really seem like no brainers now, now that we have the, the technology and the costs and, and, and everything in place. And so in a similar way, we can get there with alternative proteins. Um, you know, these are still early in terms of their market penetration. Plant-based products are just, you know, 1% or so of the market in some countries. Um, but smart policies that we established today can really accelerate those timelines for alternative proteins to hit that sort of inflection point on a much quicker rate than we otherwise would. And that's going to be really crucial for, you know, meeting our climate obligations on time. It seems that the renewable energy industry and electric cars, um, how the government has helped to accelerate those industries really provides a roadmap for how we can also accelerate alternative proteins. Um, I was wondering, could you please define what an S-curve is? I know you've talked a little bit about it just now that it's, that's, that it's the sort of inflection point um, at which maybe industry can, can accelerate a little bit more. I was just wondering if you could break that down for the attendees a little bit. Yes, yeah, so I think there's you know various studies of, of sort of innovations that have come onto the marketplace and how they diffuse into society. And generally a lot of technologies follow what's called a sort of S-curve. So rather than sort of just being linearly adopted over time on a sort of predictable year over year basis, there is some point in time where after a lot of really, you know, struggling times to get initial prototypes onto the marketplace and iterate on designs, et cetera, where eventually a lot of things coincide together to make, you know, the costs and the product market fit work such that you reach a sort of inflection point of adoption where 
just all of a sudden everything is is sort of ubiquitous and out there. And so, I mean, people are very familiar with things like um, you know televisions or cell phones being you know following this sorts of curve. Um, and and we expect, I think, with innovative products like alternative proteins that are very sort of science driven uh, underlying underneath the hood, um, I think we can expect similar sort of uh, curves to be followed. Awesome, that sounds very interesting. Um, Emily, I wanted to turn to you. I'm very curious, we talked a little bit about um, job opportunities at the beginning, um, but I was wondering more specifically, what opportunities could cultivated meat or alt protein production provide to rural populations that may have relied on agriculture, for example? How can policymakers maximize and then capture these opportunities for those economies? So I think that there's a, a great deal of opportunity for, for job creation and, and economic growth in this space, for rural communities in particular. Um, you know, everything from larger scale production facilities um, to other supply chain, other job opportunities throughout the supply chain, whether that's distribution or manufacturing of the equipment that'll be used in, in these production facilities. Um, all of these can create new economic opportunities for rural communities. Um, the great thing about cultivated meat is that there's also potential for that in, in more urban and more dense areas because um, theoretically uh, production facilities could, could, be, could be quite small at some point in the future. But I think um, that um, initially um, in order to reach scale and bring costs down, that um, many of these facilities will, will, will more likely be located in, in uh, more rural areas. And again, there's, there are a lot of uh, examples of government programs that uh, specifically focus on incentivizing uh, economic opportunities in rural areas. So the USDA, for instance, USDA's rural development is, um, is all about job creation and, and economic development in rural areas. So I think tapping into some existing um, policy frameworks and opportunities and incentives um, that exist both in the US and, um, and abroad um, are, is, a, is a great way to start, but that we should also be looking to see if there are other unique um, policy needs in order to incentivize um, uh, cultivated meat manufacturing facilities to be placed in, in you know, in, in certain historically underserved communities or, or communities that have been, you know, you know, particularly hard hit by the transition from the coal industry or, or, or other things like that. And this could be seen as an opportunity to do um, community revitalization work. Um, and that's a very different framing than um, what's, what we sometimes hear in terms of uh, job loss and and some some fear that's created by some in the agricultural community. So a lot of opportunities there. Yes, and you can start thinking about, uh, you know, planning for that now and thinking about the right incentives and the way to potentially mitigate any negative impacts. Um, before we transition to our audience q and I'll be asking a couple more questions of Emily and Elliot, and I would like to just encourage attendees, feel free to add your questions in the, into the chat. I see a lot of good ones um, already. Um, Elliot, so before we transition, you know, the LCATA obviously added a great deal to our understanding of the future of cultivated meat. I was wondering what other research do you think needs to be done in order to continue to advance policy in support of cultivated meat? Sure, so I mean, the, the first and most obvious thing is to do more of these sorts of studies, um, especially those that bring new perspectives and data to the discussion. So. Um, those will be really important to inform us, especially as the uh, industry grows, um, you know, challenge some of the assumptions in this report, update them over time, et cetera. Uh, as you alluded to, um, you know, we sort of modeled one process in this, in this particular set of studies, but others could potentially exist. And so modeling different process scenarios um, will be important as aspects of those additional studies. Um, as well as those with regional focuses. So, uh, you know, sort of ingrained or inherent in these sorts of studies are, you know, supply chain considerations, electricity, labor, access to all of the above. Um, and that varies by region. And so 
Um, having sort of regionally focused studies, I think, can best inform some of the policy strategies at the national level. Um, in addition to that, I think we need better industry forecasts um, so that policymakers are really in tune with, you know, the state of the industry and its growth rate. So some policies you can imagine, as I mentioned before, can be constructed to really catalyze an industry, but others could be more to build it up and, and sustain it. And so you sort of need to know what to expect. And, and these forecasts, I think, would also go a long way in helping investors, um, regulators, as well as other companies that want to participate in, in the supply chain. And then lastly, we just need more foundational research and development tools and knowledge, um, as I sort of started our, off with. Um, particularly important would be cell line banks. Um, in the biomedicinal sector, those cell banks are usually funded by national research institutes. And so similar initiatives could be taken here for cultivated meat. And we also just really need foundational research around, you know, how to culture these cells, what medium formulations um, do they like uh, for the variety of species and cell types used in the industry. And we just don't have a lot of that foundational knowledge yet due to some of the um, lack of funding that we've seen. Great. And um, I was just wondering, Emily, you know, the UN Food System Summit is happening tomorrow. And, you know, obviously Alt Proteins um, extends beyond the U.S. Um, as you've mentioned, we've talked about Singapore, for example, and COP26 will also be happening in early November, uh, which is the U.N.'s climate conference. So as more and more people make that connection between climate and food, I was wondering, um, you know, what do you think needs to happen um, to get Alt Proteins on the global cl climate policy agenda? Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep this brief so we have time to answer a few of the audience questions and um, put a link in the chat to a report that GFI wrote with climate advisors that outlines some, um, some policy opportunities at the international level. But I, I will note that I do think that there is a need to build more global scientific consensus around, um, around proteins and protein transition. And so um, one of the recommendations that we included in that report is to, to do a multilateral scientific assessment of the, the, of the protein transition. Um, and so at the level of, of the UN um, and other multilateral agencies, um, there is a really clear understanding of the opportunities and, and potential there. Um, and we've, we've seen lots of momentum and I'm really excited about the UN Food System Summit tomorrow, um, but, but it's really just to start and when we need more, definitely more work in this, in this area moving forward. Definitely, and I think that this is actually a really good segue into one of the questions from the audience from William George. He was wondering, you know, are there any reasons to be optimistic about increased government support for this space, particularly outside of Singapore and Israel at this time, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, the last the last 12 months have been really exciting around uh, public funding for alternative proteins. Um, some of you uh, may have seen the National Science Foundation um, uh, presentation conversation earlier today, but you know, the, the U.S.'s first cultivated meat research center was funded by the National Science Foundation last year. Um, we have seen a lot of enthusiasm and interest um, in, in various parts of Europe. Um, so I, I do think that, that it's not just Singapore and Israel. We are seeing growing interest um, in, in the U.S. for the first time, alternative protein research was defined as climate science research um, in uh, an appropriations report earlier this year. So it, it really does feel like a lot of the pieces are coming together, um, and and hopefully this this momentum will continue. I'll just maybe add on to that too. Is that uh, you know we've seen in in Japan funding for uh, cultivated meat research. Um, really earmarked $20 million in papers are beginning to come out from that, that are sort of build on this open access uh, research. Um, and we're seeing parts of the Middle East, uh, like Qatar and other regions that are worrying in a similar way, like Singapore about food security, to focus uh, more heavily on alternative protein investments and, and infrastructure there. Um, and as Emily mentioned, yeah, funding from the EU Horizon 2020 program has gone into building some of the early stage um, cultivated meat and B2B companies in the sector. So um, we're starting to see some
some trickles, uh, but a lot more uh, will definitely be needed. Definitely a lot of optimism there then. Unfortunately, with the time we have, that will be our last question. I wanted to thank all of you for tuning in and especially Emily, Elliot, and Lauren for making this panel happen. I also wanted to touch on a few helpful resources if you're interested in learning about this topic further. Um, GFI has both a blog and the full report linked on their website, as well as a separate page for their policy recommendations that you can go check out online. If you want to stay up to date, you can also sign up with um, sign up for pol GFI's policy newsletter as well. So I want to thank everyone again, and please be sure to check out the rest of the panels for the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.